they've been seen over England. This was not just a UFO sighting, it was essentially a security incident. The United States and Belgium. They were violating airspace rules. The Belgian Air Force had to do something about it. Massive triangular shaped craft hovering in the skies. Thousands of people from around the world have seen them, but investigators don't know what they are. The triangular UFO mystery is a matter of national defense. We have large triangular platforms moving with impunity through controlled airspace. We seem to be at odds to come to terms with what they are, how they're being operated, or their point of origin. Unidentified flying objects have been seen in our skies for decades. Thousands of UFO sightings have been documented in official government files. Most have logical, scientific explanations. Yet some cases remain unexplained, classified, unidentified. Can newly released files reveal the truth behind these UFO encounters? March 31st, 1990. At Bovachain Air Force Base in Belgium, two F-16s are scrambled to investigate a violation of Belgian airspace. Eve Milbergs is a fighter pilot with the 350th Squadron. He's ordered to address the threat. The operations center told us something was going on with uh, the U-4 over, over Belgium. Captain Milbergs has been briefed with a description of the object they are looking for. It was a kind of object of uh, triangular shape Okay, with uh, lights on the edge, kind of dome on top, moving really slowly without noise, and sometimes accelerating uh, very fast beyond uh, supersonic speeds. The order was to intercept and eventually identify those objects. This is the official Belgian Air Force report of the event. It presents an exact timeline of the evening. 12.30 a.m. Milberg's F-16 has radar contact 20 nautical miles from Bovachain Air Force Base. The target is moving extremely fast, 740 knots. So we picked up the, the target uh, the first time at about 20 miles. We had a radar contact, so we could see on the radar a blip. This is the actual radar recording from Captain Milberg's F-16. The square at the top is the target which was, uh, in fact, uh, the confirmation that there was uh, something in the air at that moment. And it was the same contact as the ground station observed as well. The two F-16 pilots are closing in on their target, but they are about to discover whatever their target is, it's certainly no ordinary aircraft. Each time the F-16 were turning into the objects, they disappeared from the screens. What exactly is Captain Milberg's tracking on his radar? Over the last four months, there have been many reports of strange objects flying over Belgium. Hundreds of people describe unusual, triangular-shaped craft in the skies. It all started in the small town of Uppen, just six miles from the German border. On November 29th, 1989, two police officers on patrol spot something unusual in the sky. They noticed very bright lights hovering over an open field. And these bright lights were affixed to some type of triangular platform, as they described it. Author and UFO researcher David Marler has extensively studied this incident. The object encompassed the field that was near their vehicle. It was silent. The object then begins to move slowly toward the town. They were gobsmacked as far as what they were looking at. They had no frame of reference for this. The initial two police officers who saw it light up the field, they followed it for a while. Author and investigative journalist Leslie Kane has interviewed many of the eyewitnesses who were involved. And it ended up over Lake Gillespie. They watched the thing for over an hour sitting above Lake Gillespie. And what they saw was something extraordinary. 
The craft was releasing a red light bulb that was shooting out horizontally along the surface of the lake, and then it was pulling it back in. The red ball and moved around by an apparent independent means. Then, the two officers watch as a second triangular UFO rises up over a row of trees by the edge of the lake. It hovers silently alongside the first UFO. They contacted the dispatcher in Yupon, and he laughed and said it might be Santa Claus, you know, coming in to land. And they stated that we're not joking, this is something very serious. By the end of the night, hundreds of eyewitnesses, including 14 police officers, report seeing the strange, unidentified flying objects. Hundreds of people reported it, and they made independent reports with drawings without knowing what anybody else had seen. Many of the witnesses, including the two police officers who followed the object to the lake, make drawings independently of one another. The triangular objects these drawings depict are strikingly similar. Over the past 30 years, more than 10,000 sightings have been reported in North America and Europe alone. Black, delta-shaped flying objects, all filed under one ominous name black triangles. Most people think of UFOs as being saucer-shaped, like disks, flying saucers. But actually, over recent decades, there have been many reports of triangular-shaped UFOs, and these were the ones that were seen over Belgium. This is the largest reported type of UFO shape that is now being documented. We hear reports where they're very large, immense in size. They're the size of a football field. Some witnesses have stated these objects can perform radical flight maneuvers. These maneuvers are seen with the complete absence of sound. Oftentimes there may be an electromagnetic effect associated with these craft. Could these strange triangles be caused by some unexplained natural phenomena? Are they man-made? Or do they come from somewhere else? The Belgian Black Triangle sightings of November 1989 and the investigation that followed would be the first to try to publicly answer those questions. After the events of November 29th, 1989, it became a media frenzy. In the press, Belgian UFOs became the topic of the day. Were they being visited by alien spacecraft? Or is it something else? Whatever the objects are, night after night, they continue to return. In the four months following the sightings over Upen, over 500 reports of UFOs are made to Belgian authorities. The military was taking a keen interest in the subject. They obviously did not want to cause a panic, but at the same time, they weren't discounting these reports. Uh, the reports were unusual, to say the least, uh, but they were coming from credible individuals, and the sheer volume of reports forced the Belgian military to take the subject seriously. The Belgian Air Force was concerned about this and had to take some action because there was something invading their airspace. It was their responsibility to protect the skies over Belgium. They had to do something about it. The Belgian Air Force develops a plan. If an eyewitness report is confirmed by radar, fighter jets will be scrambled to intercept the object. March 30th, 1990. Just before 11 p.m., an off-duty police officer observes strange lights over the town of Jean Bleu. The lights form a triangle. The Belgian wave really came to a head on the night of March 30th, 1990. This involved sightings being reported by the citizenry in several municipalities, some by uh, off-duty police officers who had observed a series of triangular arrays of lights moving overhead. The Belgian Air Force report shows that at 11 p.m., the Glan Control Reporting Center receives a phone call from the policeman reporting the strange lights in the sky. Fifteen minutes later, military radar at Glan picks up an unidentified object moving very slowly at 25 knots towards the west. Then, radar at the primary Air Force Control Center confirms the target in the same position. Glan Control gives the order to scramble jets. Captain Eve Milbergs has located the UFO. 
His plane's radar shows it is only seven nautical miles away. It was uh, dark, uh, there was no lights at the object, and uh, we couldn't see anything. Relying only on their instruments, the two F-16 pilots move to engage the target. If it's a breach of Belgian airspace by a foreign military, what Mühlbergs does next could spark an international incident. Over an hour after an off-duty police officer reports a strange object in the sky, two F-16s are closing in on their target. Captain Mühlbergs has a radar lock on. He's just about to intercept when the target suddenly appears to take evasive action. The target was rapidly reacting, changing heading and attitude and, and speeds. The apparent object begins to move at radical speeds around Captain Mühlberg's radar screen. The performance of that object is really outstanding. It had speeds going from very low speed until supersonic speed, so it was quite difficult to intercept that target. The official Belgian Air Force report clearly states Three times the pilots managed to lock on to the target, but each time the UFO suddenly changes course. It accelerates from 150 knots to an incredible 970 knots, almost 1,200 miles per hour in just a few seconds. We could manage to, to close in, and the closest distance we could achieve was five nautical miles. The pilots make nine attempts to intercept the object, but they can never get close enough to make visual contact. The only thing you can tell is what you observed that day, so that's basically an identified object. What is that object? Because so far we, we still don't know. But the Belgian Air Force has what they consider solid evidence. A radar recording of the entire event taken from the cockpit of Captain Mühlberg's F-16. Do these actual radar recordings contain the data to determine exactly what the F-16s chased that night? So what we're seeing here is the radar data collected from the F-16 radar. Dr. Ravi Raj Advi specializes in radar signal processing. His first question was whether the radar recorded a meteorological event. I don't believe so because this is not consistent with the profile of something that would be natural. Dr. Advi consults a graph containing the radar data. We see that the target falls down to about 6,000 feet, but then it rapidly gains height and then starts falling at an extremely rapid rate to the point where it almost crashes into the ground. At the same time, it's making incredible changes in speed. The speed jumps from about 175 knots to about 600 knots in less than a second. That is an insane acceleration that um, just doesn't seem physically possible. It does another jump, right at the end, it's moving at a thousand knots toward the ground. We haven't recovered any debris from any crashes, right? but it should have crashed. The extreme acceleration captured on the F-16's radar is beyond the performance of any known aircraft. But Dr. Advi doesn't believe this is an alien spacecraft. It is my feeling that this is a fake target created by an electronic countermeasure system to spoof this radar. This is a sophisticated type of radar jamming. This kind of technology is used by military defense applications. They are used to create false targets so that an enemy radar believes that there are many aircraft out there while there are really none. The Belgian F-16s at that time carried the version of a Vietnam era radar that was on the F-4. Bill Sweetman is an aviation writer and expert in top secret military projects. So certainly not a sophisticated piece of equipment, um, not very resistant to jamming, not very resistant to deception. The ground-based radars are a little more powerful, they work in a different band, but jamming systems are designed to address all the bands, so they would be affected. If radar jamming caused the F-16s to chase a false target, then what were the thousands of Belgians actually seeing above their homes that night? Some of the skeptics have claimed that it was helicopters. The low level that they were flying, and even what they looked like, too. The lights on some helicopters are arranged in a triangular pattern. But the witness reports of the UFO's flight characteristics don't resemble the characteristics of a helicopter. Helicopters are noisy. These objects were completely silent. The other thing about the Belgian objects is that they would zoom off at the blink of an eye. Helicopters don't do that. The many eyewitnesses were adamant that whatever the object they had seen 
was no helicopter. Evidence suggests that something physical flew over Belgian airspace. This demands the attention of the nation's highest aviation officer, Air Force Chief of Operations, Colonel Wilfred de Brouwer. The only thing he could think about was that it could be some kind of stealth technology from America. This Department of Defense Intelligence report records that Colonel de Brouwer directly asked officials in the United States about two top secret stealth planes. The F-117 Nighthawk and the B-2 Stealth Bomber. They are both dark in color and have an unusual triangular shape. Is it possible that one of these aircraft was behind the eyewitness reports that night? He was informed very clearly that it was not. And this is written up in an official American document that the Americans informed him that it was not one of theirs. It's always a remote possibility. It's something that people see in the sky over Belgium. It's always possible that something like that could be a classified program under test. The late 80s were a time when the Black Project world was expanding very fast. Could it be that the Americans hid the fact that they were testing top secret aircraft? The triangles could conceivably be aircraft. There have been aircraft designs studied that look like that. Belgium's location, close to the eastern front of the Cold War, could have also played a part. There might be a few reasons why you test a secret aircraft outside the US. For example, you might want to test it against different defensive systems. You might have wanted to fly close to the former Soviet Union and just see if anything would pick it up. But even if the sightings are of top secret aircraft, the US government may have denied their existence. With the Belgian public demanding answers, Colonel de Brouwer makes an unprecedented move and releases his findings to the media. S'il y en a eu un, euh, a accéléré à une vitesse qui était tout à fait en dehors du domaine de vol d'un avion conventionnel. It was very interesting what he presented at the press conference, and also interesting that it was all made public. The information was provided to the press. It, the data showed that there was something there that couldn't be explained, and there was no secrecy about it. After March 31st, fewer and fewer sightings of black triangles are reported, and the Belgian wave comes to an end. Then, three years later, there is another incident. This time, it's British airspace that is being violated. Cosford, England, March 31st, 1993. Exactly three years to the day since the mass sightings of mysterious black triangles in Belgium. 140 miles north of London, two Royal Air Force police officers are on patrol outside of RAF Cosford. The control of Air Force police stopped their car, got out, and looked directly overhead. They saw two bright white lights, but they weren't able to ascertain whether or not they were separate objects or lights on the underside of a much bigger craft. The strange object is completely silent. The two corporals return immediately to base and file this report. The corporal's written report is the earliest account of the strange events of the night. Events which will come to be known as the Cosford Incident. This is RAF Cosford, where the UFO sighting actually took place. In 1993, Nick Pope was part of the UFO investigation unit within the British Ministry of Defense. My job was to research and investigate all sightings reported to the Ministry of Defense to see if there was evidence of any potential threat to the United Kingdom. This is Pope's official Ministry of Defense report. It documents the most prolific wave of UFO sightings in British history. This sighting at Cosford really kick-started an investigation which was to bring in dozens and dozens of other reports, including sightings of large triangular-shaped craft. It isn't just military personnel who filed reports. Ten minutes after the sightings at RAF Cosford, something is seen 18 miles northeast of the base.
one family saw the UFO in a town called Rougely. They uh, got into their car, as I recall, and actually tried to chase this thing. One of the witnesses described this vast craft passing directly overhead. They heard a humming sound coming from it, and they thought that this thing was so low that it had actually landed in a field in a place called Hazelside. And when they got to the area, there was nothing to be seen. The RAF police determined that no military or civil aircraft activity had taken place that night that might explain these sightings. 20 miles away, at a second military base, RAF Shabri, the meteorological officer on duty, sees what appears to be the same unidentified flying object. The Met officer described to me how this UFO flew slowly towards the base and then pretty much over it. He described it to me as a, a vast uh, triangular or delta-shaped craft. And he said that there was a low frequency humming sound. And he said he felt it reverberating through his body and he said it was an extremely disconcerting sensation. He saw a pencil thin beam of light shoot down from this craft and track backwards and forwards across the fields surrounding the military base. He said almost as if it was looking for something. Then he said after a few minutes, uh, the beam of light just switched off and the UFO accelerated away to the horizon many times faster than the military jet. And he said, well, look, I see fast jets on an almost daily basis. This was orders of magnitude above and beyond that speed. During an eight hour period, more than 200 sightings are reported all over Southern England. One by one, we eliminated all the usual things that people misidentify. Bright stars and planets, uh, satellites, meteors, uh, aircraft lights, weather balloon launches. And the more of these explanations we crossed off, the more you know, mysterious and exciting this seemed to be. And the sense from my colleagues and myself, who normally came at this from a very skeptical viewpoint, was, my goodness, there is something really bizarre going on here. After a month-long investigation, Pope's team is convinced that what people reported as being more than just lights was, in fact, a real object. There's no doubt in my mind that this is as real as it gets. A huge craft was operating over the UK that night. Despite this conclusion, they are mystified as to the origin and nature of this craft. One of our theories, of course, was secret prototype aircraft or drone. Just as the Belgians had done, the British asked the United States government if it could be one of theirs. A large triangular craft capable of hovering and they get the same answer. Now the Americans uh, told us we have no such aircraft and no such test flights have been conducted over the United Kingdom. Still suspicious, Pope uses a back channel to inquire if the CIA or other defense agencies might be involved. The American defense secretary was apparently incandescent with rage. If we say it doesn't exist, uh, it doesn't exist. And we had to act very quickly to stop this flaring up into a full diplomatic row with our greatest ally. With his investigation dead-ended, Nick Pope can only wonder what the unidentified object actually is. I have no realistic assessment of what this could be. If it wasn't some secret prototype aircraft decades ahead of anything that's public knowledge, then I'm stumped. I have no idea. The Cosford incident remains unexplained to this day. Clearly, I can't rule out the possibility that this was an extraterrestrial spacecraft. Government investigators in Belgium and England have been unable to determine the origin of the Black Triangles. And with no conclusive evidence, the mystery of their appearance is left unsolved. But seven years later, they appear again. 
January 5th, 2000, St. Clair County, Illinois. Officer Ed Barton is on overnight patrol when he receives a call from Central Police Dispatch. Well, this is a call from Highland PD. When he receives the call, Officer Barton is driving south on the main road into the small city of Lebanon. This is the actual police recording from that night. The truck driver just stopped in. He said there was a flying object in the area of Lebanon. The recording presents a minute-by-minute -minute account of one of the best documented reports of an unidentified flying object. It's very rare that we have official documentation that chronicles the wave of sightings as it was taking place. Journalist David Marler is an investigator with MUFON, North America's largest UFO investigation organization. In 2000, Marler led the investigation into this case. The overall tone of the recordings at first were somewhat lighthearted and jovial. It was like a two-story house. It had white lights and red blinking lights. Possibly, could you check the area? If I see it, I'm not saying a word. Officer Ed Barton, he was ready just to simply write it off. But then he noticed lights moving toward the east part of town. Upon closer approach, he realized that the lights were affixed to a large triangular object that was low altitude. The vehicle is a very bright white light east of town. Also, there's two neighbors' aircraft. It doesn't look like an aircraft, though. In my personal investigation of the case, I spoke with Officer Ed Barton from Lebanon, Illinois. This is Ed Barton's statement given to David Marler only days after the event. In it, he says the object hovered at about 1,000 feet almost directly overhead. Officer Barton stated, as this object was hovering above me, every aircraft that I've ever seen or know of makes some type of noise. This aircraft made no noise. After several minutes, the object pivoted and sped towards the southwest at high speed. He wonders if it's some kind of experimental military craft. Would you contact Scott Air Force Base to see if they have flying in this area, please? Scott Air Force Base is only three miles away. Officer Barton believes it could be one of theirs. It's heading westbound now. It should be really close to Scott now. Matter of fact, if the Shiloh officer looks up, they can probably see it by now. The village of Shiloh is right next to Scott Air Force Base. At 4.24 a.m., Officer David Martin of the Shiloh Police Department responds to Barton's call. I see something, but I don't know what that is. But just as he finds the slow-moving object, it suddenly shoots away at high speed into the distance. Fifteen minutes later, outside the village of Milstad, Officer Craig Stevens spots it. Sincom 6004. Go ahead. I've got that object inside also. Are you serious? It's huge. 604, does it look like a, what does it look like to you? It's kind of V-shaped. Officer Craig Stevens manages to take a photo before the object disappears from view. But due to the freezing conditions, the Polaroid doesn't turn out. Although lights can be seen on the image, there's not enough detail to see what the object is. But with the sighting still fresh in his mind, Stevens makes these sketches for David Marler's report. The object's shape is distinctly triangular. 23 minutes later, in the village of Dupo, a fourth officer reports seeing the object. By plotting the four police sightings on a map, the object's flight path can be established. It travels 38 miles over a one-hour period, rare evidence of the movement of a UFO. The so-called Highland UFO makes headlines across the country, and like the Belgians and British before it, Marler begins with the obvious. I was mainly interested in seeing if the military was testing any type of experimental aircraft that might have been in the area. The fact that it was seen near a major military installation warranted that question. The estimated flight path of the alleged UFO shows it would have flown within two miles of Scott Air Force Base a perfect position to be tracked on radar. 
The police and military refuse to comment. David Marler takes the investigation a step further. I filed a Freedom of Information Act request with Scott Air Force Base, and I have the official documentation as a result. In a letter dated January 19, 2000, two weeks after the event, the commander of Scott Air Force Base responds to Marler's questions. They came back and stated negative that they had no military aircraft in the area. They weren't testing or supporting the test of any vehicle in the area at that time. But when Marler requests the radar data, he gets a response he isn't expecting. They stated that at the time of the UFO sighting, their radar systems were down. They were not operating. It's a surprising twist, especially when the radar data could be hard evidence of a UFO. But this doesn't stop Marler's investigation. He still wants to know what the four police officers witnessed in the sky. Initially, I thought it was military in origin. It seemed to be the most practical explanation. But when we look at the eyewitness testimony, when we look at the description of this large triangular UFO, it bears striking similarities to Belgium, to Cosford. And at this point, we have to look at this information and come away with the fact that these witnesses are essentially describing the same type of object, if not the same object. Bill Sweetman also sees a link between the objects. There are conceivable aircraft that would account for some of the phenomena that people have described as black triangles, would account for some of the things seen at Cosford, some of the things seen at, uh, in Belgium. But most of what has gone on in the black world, we really don't know anything about. Most top secret projects tested in the 1980s and 90s have not been declassified. Marler's source for UFO research is the Air Force itself. From 1947 to 1969, the U.S. Air Force investigates thousands of UFO sightings. It begins with Project Sign, which is followed by Project Grudge. It officially becomes known as Project Blue Book in 1952. The three projects comprise the largest scientific study of UFOs ever undertaken. This was an extensive collection of over 12,000 reports that the United States Air Force investigated, collated, and analyzed. The United States Air Force is constantly on the alert, 24 hours a day. We're interested in anything that flies in our atmosphere. Project Blue Book's objectives are to scientifically analyze UFO data and determine whether UFOs pose a threat to national security. Of the more than 12,000 Air Force Blue Book UFO sightings, most are explained as birds, planes, stars, or clouds. 6% have no conventional explanation, and the Air Force classifies them as unidentified. One file is known as Incident 398, a triangular UFO sighting in Baltimore on June 29, 1949. The primary witness was an art student he was also a, a former uh, United States Air Force tech sergeant and World War II veteran, so he was familiar with aircraft. At 6.30 p.m., a witness spots something moving through the clouds. He thinks it may be an aircraft, but not like anything he saw during the war. He noticed not one, not two, not three, but numerous triangular UFOs during daylight hours, flying around almost as if in a swarm moving back and forth in and out of the clouds. In the Project Blue Book file, he clearly states, there were approximately 15 to 20 V-shaped objects flying in circular formation. They didn't appear to have engines, landing gear, or conventional aircraft construction. They were black. They appeared to be extremely maneuverable and capable of a terrific rate of speed. These triangular UFOs exhibited unusual flight characteristics in the sense that they were darting about, moving in and out of the clouds. Over a two-hour period, the man's neighbors also witnessed the same strange objects. The witnesses even stated we couldn't determine how many there were because they were moving about, bustling around like bees. But uh, when visible, they could clearly discern a triangular shape. Being an art student, the witness immediately sketches what he saw making a special point to highlight the shape of the unidentified craft, triangular. The witness contacts the United States Air Force to report the unusual sighting. 
He says he has observed airplanes from a distance and birds in flight many times. He has never seen anything like this before in his life. This is the actual sketch the witness drew. Air Force investigators determine the objects are not detected by radar, nor are they seen by any pilots flying in the vicinity. If not birds or conventional aircraft, what could they be? When we look at 1949, we can look back now with a fair degree of certainty and know what was the cutting edge technology of the time, since everything at that time has been declassified. It turns out there is a top secret program at the time that may fit the Baltimore case. The Northrop YB-49, or flying wing. Could this have been what the eyewitnesses saw? In 1949, Northrop had been testing the flying wing aircraft in various forms for a couple of years. And that was an extraordinary looking aircraft of the era. It still is, really. However, Bill Sweetman doesn't believe the Northrop flying wing could have been what the many eyewitnesses saw that day. The flying wing was not a very maneuverable aircraft. Any hard maneuvering would cause the aircraft to fall out of the sky. It's an aircraft you had to fly very carefully even then. The Baltimore case turns out to be just one of many secret Air Force investigations into black triangles during the 1940s and 50s. Another triangular UFO sighting documented in Project Blue Book happened on January 28, 1953. It's a report from inside the U.S. Air Force, signed by the commanding officer of Turner Air Force Base in Albany, Georgia. At 9.35 p.m., a U.S. Air Force pilot is flying a T-33 jet just outside of Albany. The pilot is a seasoned officer with 11 years experience and 3,100 hours of flying time. On this routine night flight, he spots something strange in front of his plane. Before he knew it, the light which was above him was now below him, which immediately ruled out satellite, star, or planet. In the Project Blue Book file, the pilot states that the object constantly changed color, from white to orange and back. As if that wasn't strange enough, the object, in his own words, changed into an equilateral triangle. He then witnessed the triangle divide into two equilateral triangles, which shot off in different directions. Aviation expert Bill Sweetman has a simple explanation for this unusual event. We talk about people flying jets in Georgia in the 1950s. It's a pretty new environment for people to be flying in, in terms of speed, in terms of being single-seater at night, in terms of working with you know, very, very crude radar. So it's you know, very easy to see that somebody could become confused. Very, very difficult environment. But the official evidence in this case suggests something else. The Project Blue Book file reveals that at the time of the pilot's sighting, the Albany airport had radar contact with the object. Evidence that this may not have been a hallucination. But despite the radar contact, the Air Force investigators reach a conclusion that surprises David Marler. The Albany, Georgia case was concluded to be the planet Venus, a visual sighting of the planet Venus, which really stretches the imagination when you look at the fact that the pilot was able to see Venus below him. I don't always agree with the Air Force's explanation of some of these sightings, but uh, the testimony that is documented within those files is beyond reproach. When we look at the characteristics, we look at the consistencies in the narratives of these individuals, when we look at the radar confirmation, there is solidity to these objects. These are not hallucinations, these are not fantasies, these are not aberrations due to atmospheric conditions. We're dealing with a real, solid, tangible reality that needs to be investigated. From the recent sightings in Belgium, England, and the United States, to the accounts investigator David Marler has uncovered in the 1940s and 50s, black triangles appear to be a phenomenon that stretches back decades. Marler's investigation leads him further into the past. 
in doing a comprehensive review of newspaper archives. And I started coming across cases dating back further and further and then finding other documentation of cases going back to the late 19th century. It really begs the question, what are we dealing with here? The most prestigious scientific journals of the 19th century contain numerous reports of strange black triangular objects in the sky. This is decades before the first planes ever flew. The earliest account I have is 1882 that was observed and documented in Scientific American. July 3rd, 1882, Lebanon, Connecticut. Two astronomers making observations of the moon witness a strange sight. The UFOs that were reported were seen moving over the surface of the moon by astronomers. And they described not one, but two triangular dark objects moving over the lunar surface. The astronomer's report states they see two black triangular notches on the lower half of the moon. They move toward each other along the moon's edge and seem to be obliterated nearly a quarter of its surface. In the report, they offer no suggestion as to what these triangular objects could be. This is one of the earliest reports of a triangular UFO. It predates manned flight by over two decades. And there are more reports. In the scientific journal Nature, a writer describes seeing a stationary dark patch in the sky. It is fan-shaped and held its position for more than half an hour. Marler's investigation uncovers reports from all around the world. Flying triangles capable of controlled flight and able to ascend high into the clouds. The descriptions of black triangles in the 19th century are similar to the descriptions in modern times. Are they describing the same object? You can look at cases from the late 1800s, 1940s, 1980s, 2011, and they're consistent. There doesn't appear to be an evolution in technology as we would have it with man-made technology. When you look at the last 60 years of aviation development, you see an evolution in the technology. What we don't see with these triangular UFOs is an evolution in technology. Marler's extensive research gives him the confidence to propose a very controversial theory. Really makes me lean towards the fact that some underline that three times, some of these triangular UFOs may be of non-terrestrial origin. For Leslie Kane, the issue of black triangles comes down to two options. What they're left with was either the very remote possibility that it was some kind of advanced, super secret technology that some other country had developed. The other option is that it was something extraterrestrial. Bill Sweetman believes there could be a much simpler answer to the phenomenon. I think the most likely explanation for most unidentified flying object sightings is that people saw something that wasn't really there. With even the U.S. Air Force officially declaring over 700 cases unidentified within Project Blue Book, it's clear that the UFO mystery will be difficult to solve. As an investigator, I'm delving into it. I'm trying to gain additional information in the hope that one day we will have answers. An unsolved UFO case is rather like an unsolved crime. So I'm skeptical that we'll ever get a definitive explanation of this, but of course I hope that some new information does come to light and we finally solve the mystery. The official documents and files provide supporting evidence that triangular UFOs have been seen over the past decades, if not centuries. Are the sightings simply mistaken identity? Top secret military aircraft? Or are they literally something from another world? Case study, Black Triangles, remains unresolved. Next, the home movies of the enthusiasts who helped save Britain's inland waterways. Gina McKee narrates the golden age of canals here on Yesterday. <laughs> 